five years ago. Putting child care infrastructure in place will help American parents join and stay in the labor force here as well. We must support child care and early education for our nation's children from all walks of life so that they can reach their potential and become the best learners that they can be and so that families, parents, and children together can thrive. As we begin to see the consequences of the disastrous Dobbs decision unfold across America, the need to support reproductive health and family planning services has never been higher. The President's request prioritizes women's health, which includes an increase of more than $100 million for Title X family planning, as well as maternal and child health programs, including an increase of $27 million for Healthy Start, which reduces maternal mortality, and doubling of funding for the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health to expand the use of patient safety bundles, which address the causes of maternal mortality and morbidity, and to reduce the number of maternity care deserts. These are fundamental pieces of our health care safety net, and I will continue to fight to ensure these programs have the resources to serve every woman and child in need in this country. This budget would transform women's health research by doubling funding for the National Institutes of Health Office of Research on Women's Health, which would fund research on maternal mortality, morbidity, menopause, sex differences on health outcomes, and a range of health issues that are specific to women. When I joined the Appropriations Committee in 1993, I was proud to work with my dear friend and our former chairwoman, Nita Lowy, in securing language in the NIH Revitalization Act, mandating that women and minorities be included in all NIH-funded clinical trials and in a manner sufficient to obtain information about both sexes and diverse racial and ethnic groups. In fiscal year 2021, as chair, I was proud to include a line item for the Office of Women's Health Research so that it had a dedicated budget and grant-making authority to ensure there was specific funding uh, for NIH-supported research that addresses issues that affect women, promote the inclusion of women in clinical research, and develop and expand opportunities for women throughout the biomedical research career pipeline. And this funding has grown thanks to bipartisan support for this office. Let me also recognize the President for his executive order this week to further expand the White House initiative on women's health research, which is building on our efforts over the past few decades to elevate research on women's health to equal standing. This initiative is led by First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, and I might add by my dear friend, Dr. Carolyn Missouri, the former head of the Women's Health Research Health Program at Yale University in New Haven. She is a world-renowned leader in women's health research. I am pleased to see the administration take further steps to bolster the capacity for public health agencies, including $500 million, an increase, $500 million increase for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, including for the first time $20 million in dedicated funding for wastewater surveillance, which is a critical method of detecting and tracking the spread of communicable disease throughout our communities. I'm also encouraged to see the strong leap forward in mental health support, increases for programs at the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services uh, Administration, which operates the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, and the Mental Health Crisis Research Partnership, Response Partnerships, and the National Institute uh, of Mental Health at the NIH. I'm also delighted to see a robust and desperately needed funding level for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. CMS is tasked with doing extraordinary critical work in administering <coughs> Medicare, <coughs> Medicaid, and CHIP for the American people with extraordinarily tight resourcing. I will continue to fight to ensure that CMS is able to achieve its mission with a level of service and quality care the American people need and deserve. There are many, many other programs at HHS funded by this subcommittee that are critical to protecting the health and the well-being of American families. Through clinical support, public health, social service programs, through groundbreaking research that keeps American health systems 
at the forefront of life-saving technological and scientific breakthroughs to protect and expand access to affordable, high-quality health care, lower drug and other health care costs, burdening American families, and to promote early childhood care and education. I look forward to securing this funding for HHS and helping deliver on the Biden administration's public health goals for the American people. I thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member. And uh, Mr. Secretary, again, we're honored to have you here today, and thank you for all that you do at the department. And uh, we would uh, we would love to hear your comments, and your, uh, of course, everything will be uh, included in the record. But uh, we look forward to you addressing us this morning and tell us a little bit about what's going on for the next uh, FY fiscal year at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Chairman Adelhout, uh, to Ranking Member DeLauro and to all the members, thank you for the invitation to talk about the President's 2025 uh, fiscal year budget. Uh, when President Biden took office in January 2021, if you recall, COVID was ravaging our families, our economy, and Americans were dying at the rate of two to three 9-11s every day. Uh, let me repeat that. Every day in America, we were losing the same number of Americans that we lost with two to three 9-11s combined every day. In January 2021, the number of Americans with health insurance was, like our jobs and the economy, down and on the canvas. In January 2021, prescription drug prices were skyrocketing, with patients and their pocketbooks at the mercy of Big Pharma and its profits. Today, three years later, nearly 700 million shots of COVID vaccines have gone into the arms of Americans, and we can now manage COVID like the flu. Today, more than 300 million Americans, a record number, can go to the doctor or hospital and not go bankrupt because they have their own health insurance. More than 21 million of those Americans count on the Affordable Care Act marketplace for their insurance, another record. Today, while Big Pharma, well, it's still big, but the president's new prescription drug law has brought down the price of insulin to $35 per month for Americans on Medicare. And as we speak, we are negotiating with drug companies to lower the prices of even more prescription drugs, even as they sue us to stop us. The president's budget doubles down on the investments that made the comeback of our jobs, our economy, and our health possible. It lays out a vision for a nation that invests in its most vulnerable, fosters innovation, and protects every American's access to the care she needs. This budget doesn't just strengthen Medicare, it strengthens it beyond our lifetime. This budget continues our shift from a health system that treats illness to one that sustains wellness. All told, the FY 2025 budget proposes $130.7 billion in discretionary and $1.7 trillion in mandatory funding to advance our mission and invest in key priorities. Let me share some of the highlights. The budget provides Medicare-like coverage to low-income individuals in the outlier states that have not expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. When that happens, another 1.5 million Americans will have health care coverage and the peace of mind that comes with it. This budget builds on the largest investment in behavioral health in a generation. It bolsters the 988 suicide and crisis lifeline. It gives young people support at home and at school. That means boosting our behavioral health workforce with 12,000 new psychiatrists, psychologists, clinical social workers, marriage and family therapists, counselors, and peer support specialists. Across HHS, the budget tackles the maternal health crisis by improving access to pre- and postnatal care, supporting emergency care services, and expanding maternal care in rural and underserved communities. We are making child care more affordable for working families and more available where families actually live and work. This budget would provide increased wages for early childhood education workers, and it would fund more than 750,000 slots for children in Head Start. And it funds universal preschool for our nation's 4 million four-year-old children. And as we move forward, eventually that will include our three-year-olds as well. Our budget grows and strengthens our cybersecurity initiatives to ensure patient safety and privacy and to keep our hospitals and providers, especially smaller ones and those in rural communities, running and secure. Finally, this administration has made tremendous strides in preparedness capabilities since the pandemic, and we keep building. 
This budget invests in countermeasures to combat antimicrobial resistant drugs, expands our monitoring of supply chains, and integrates 200 data sources across federal, state, and local governments to improve information sharing. We can't reduce the health and well-being of Americans to a line on a budget spreadsheet, but we can transform the numbers on the balance sheet into investments and services that sustain health and promote wellness for all Americans. President Biden has presented a forward-leaning budget, and Mr. Chairman, I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And um, as I mentioned in my opening statements, um, it is alarming to uh, hear about the reports of unaccompanied teenagers who enter our country illegally through the southern border and end up in the hands of human traffickers, and they're often forced to work long hours in very dangerous jobs. Um, in your previous statements, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you've compared your, your agency's work in releasing minors into the U.S. as an assembly line encourage your staff to expedite the release of children. Um, my question is, how many unaccompanied minors have actually entered the U.S. in the past three years? Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. And just to clarify, I, I didn't uh, compare the work that we do at HHS to an assembly line. I said that we had to make sure that we had operations that would move quickly and efficiently and safely to make sure that children were placed because by law, we have custody of those uh, unaccompanied children only temporarily. We must find a sponsor for them. And if we don't act expeditiously with safety in mind to find them a sponsor, then we start to have a backlog of kids at uh, CBB, the Customs and Border Protection Agency's headquarters, which do not have places for children. So what we have to do is make sure we're being efficient, always with uh, safety paramount in our minds. And that's what we have been doing. We have placed more than, uh, I believe it's more than 250,000 kids in the last few years in ver various sponsors' homes, and we will continue to do, do that process every day. But first and foremost, our, our responsibility, as you're aware, is to provide uh, the care and custody of children temporarily until we can find a vetted sponsor to place them with. So do you, do you have a, the number of how many unaccompanied monitors have entered in the last three years? Uh, I can get you the precise number, but I believe it's, uh, I, I said 250, it's probably over 300,000 over the last three years or so. What is the average time that a minor, when they're held uh, in your custody before they're released to a sponsor? Uh, excellent question, Mr. Chairman, because it, it depends. Uh, we have children in different categories because some children we know uh, are likely to have a close relative somewhere nearby in the U.S. And we are able to place a child who has a uh, uh, primary relative a lot sooner and, and more with more safety than we do with a child who doesn't have a close relative in the U.S. And so it depends. A, it could be somewhere between two to three weeks for a child where we have identified a parent in the U.S. who is uh, able to take custody. If there is no uh, close family relative, it could take several weeks. In fact, we have kids who've been with us for far longer than several weeks. What steps have you taken to expedite the release of minors from your custody to sponsors other, other than the parents or first degree relatives? We've done a number of things over the last few years. Uh, now that we have the capacity to do so, for example, we have integrated the process of discharge of the, the vetting process for children and the sponsors uh, consolidated it into one operation rather than have the more than 300 different programs that have kids do it individually. This allows us to have much more efficiency and be able to have better sight in the people who are requesting to sponsor. We also have more technology now that we can use, whether it's fingerprinting or documentation of uh, the different identifiers, uh, where people live, where they work. Uh, that information is now easier for us to access and therefore we can begin to get a sense if there is a, a sponsor that will qualify to take a child. And um, what follow-up does the department do once the minors are placed in this with a sponsor um, that is actually not their parents? Yeah. Um, appreciate the question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if the sponsor is not their parent, and we talk of immediate family members because they're not all parents, but about more than three quarters of the kids that we place end up with an immediate family member. That means a parent, uh, 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 
adult sibling, it could be uh, a grandparent, uh, but for those that don't have a, a close family relative, we will go through a process and in some cases we'll do home inspections to find out if the, the site will be uh, a good place for this child. So we go far, far further with non-relatives in doing the vetting than we do with close family members. But once they're in there, do they do you do a follow-up? Okay, so once we release them, as you're aware, uh, Congress, you all passed a law that gave us jurisdiction over these kids only while they are temporarily in our custody. We lose authority over the children. Uh, we have no custody uh, authority over the kids once we place them with a vetted sponsor. And so that child and, and the sponsor have no obligations to stay in touch with us once we have released them into their care. So and no follow-up then? We do follow up voluntarily because we think it's a, it's it's good family practice, uh, child welfare practice for us to try to make sure that the handoff goes well. So we do post-release services. We will try, for example, to reach the child and the sponsor three different times after they've been released. And so we'll try to make a phone call. If they're close by, we might do a visit, but we try to find out how they're doing to see how the transition is going. But they're under no obligation to respond to us or to communicate with us. So we don't have the authority to require that. How do you, so what do you do to ensure that the minors once they're released that they're not put to work illegally? Uh, great question because we have no jurisdiction. The Department of Labor, Labor has jurisdiction over labor violations. Uh, we've had many discussions with members of Congress on this subject. Uh, if you so choose, Congress so chooses to give us more authorities, we will implement the authorities you give us with the resources that you give us. But at this stage, uh, Mr. Chairman, there, our authority to go out and try to make sure that that child now in the community setting is doing well is not there. And we don't have the resources as well to try to do the follow-up. What we do voluntarily, we do because we think it's good welfare, child welfare, welfare practices to try to monitor the kid as best we can. This question may be, uh, you've already answered it, but uh, if you want to expand on it just a minute, but let me just ask, do you have an idea of how many unaccompanied minors that the departments has completely lost contact with uh, since you became secretary? So uh, let me make sure I, if you dissect the question, you're asking a question that the answer will be, we, we don't lose children because once we uh, discharge them after to a vetted sponsor, we don't have jurisdiction over them. So we don't, we can't track them because there's no obligation on their part or the sponsor's part to stay in touch with us. We, that handoff, and that's why it's so important for us to do a good vetting process because once we do the handoff, Congress did not give us authority to try to monitor them. So it's, we can't lose a child that we don't have the authority to track. And that's why while they're in our care, they're not exploited by uh, companies to work. While they're in our care, they get the health care that they need. While they're in their, our care, we look for the most responsible person we can find after we after vetting to release them to as a sponsor. Yeah, so once, once y'all release them, then there's really no, there's nothing. Congress did not give us authority to follow up with them. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. Maybe Congress ought to take a look at providing you with that authority and with the resources as well. Um, I, I, I'm going to focus in on child care uh, for a moment and then women's health uh, investments. Uh, child care is essential and it's in crisis. Uh, we know what happened during the pandemic uh, where the child care uh, sector was really at the verge of collapse. And, um, uh, and, and quite frankly, uh, 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 we cannot overlook this and we can't understate the role the child care providers play in our economy. Um, uh, when child care centers are open, parents go to work. If people do not have a safe, trusted child care, they're not going to go to work, and it's as simple as that. And we have the providers uh, who um, uh, are critically important in this economy. The, this committee has prioritized child care for the last five years. Uh, we increased the child care development and block grant funding by $2.7 billion um, while I was chair. In fiscal year 2024, that will be released in the next couple of days. I'm proud of the investment we make in child care. But child care funding is only reaching a fraction of the children and the families eligible. And the workforce, the workforce is struggling. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your request of $500 million for child care. How does your budget address the larger child care crisis, specifically the staffing shortages and the underpaid workforce in the child care sector. Congresswoman, thank you for the question, but most importantly, thank you for your 
dedication to this issue for the years uh, since I've known you when we were both in, members in the House back in the 90s. You've never stopped. Uh, what we do in this budget, the president makes it very clear, we're going to try to make child care affordable so parents can really feel confident that they're leaving their child in a decent place. But one of the things that we believe is necessary to make that happen is to pay people a decent wage to be child care givers. When you can leave a child care center job and go flip burgers and make more money, there's a problem. And today, child care workers make less than a preschool uh, uh, instructor who has the same type of credentialing. And certainly, as I said, you can find fast food jobs that sometimes pay you more than you can get at a child care center. So part of the resources that we're investing would be to increase wages, provide better benefits to people, because we'd like them to know that we believe in them as professionals mm -hmm. to do the work. Mm -hmm. And early child, but I was just in a daycare center in New Haven uh, last Friday, and um, they take you know, they take infants six weeks. Now those providers need to have advanced degrees. Yes. They're not. We're not just saying anybody goes in and takes care of an infant. So these people with advanced degrees and they're not getting wages commensurate with either their experience or with their or with their knowledge. So thank you for doing that. Women's health, um, a priority of mine since I came to the Congress. Everybody here knows my own history as a survivor. Thirty-seven years now of ovarian cancer. So this is very, very important to me. I was pleased that the budget includes investments in women's health. That's Title X, NIH Office on uh, Research in Women's Health, Maternal and Child Health Programs at HRSA, and more. ARPA-H is announcement of $100 million for its Women's Health Sprint, using funds from previous uh, fiscal years. Also, that the president signed his executive order on advancing women's health research and innovation this past Monday. Can you share brief highlights of the executive order and discuss the role HHS will play in implementation? What is the plan at the NIH to support the executive order on women's health research? How can we work together um, uh, and ensure that all of the relevant stakeholders understand the importance of the work? Congresswoman, we're, we're all in on this new initiative for women's health research, NIH, ARPA-H, as you mentioned. The White House certainly has been driving this ship from the very beginning. Uh, we believe it's going to make a marked difference in how we see research coming out from all the different institutions, whether it's NIH or academic institutions, where the focus will finally be on some of these diseases and conditions that have never gotten the attention they deserve. Why is it that everyone, when we hear about a heart attack, our first images of a man, when in fact, Heart disease happens to hit women harder than it does men. We want to change that. And so we're going to not only do the basic research that the NIH does, but ARPA-H, as you're aware, and thank you for the funding for ARPA-H, is, is, is engaged in a sprint. They're going to invest $100 million, but it's a public-private investment because we're going to turn to those innovators in the private sector who are having a hard time finding the investment capital they need to not only plant their idea to, to, to launch, and we're going to try to go forward with some of these ideas that can actually hit the ground in the next few years. And so stay tuned because we're going to have some great results to show. Okay. Uh, you know, thank you. Thank you very, very much. And um, uh, I want to also uh, thank you for including, again, as I said, the Title X money, which is, I think is crucial. Very important. very important for the 4,000 providers. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And uh, I just have a few seconds left, but I would just tell you when I first came and I said that with Nita Lowy, we were trying to get women and minorities into the clinical trials. We've come a distance, but now I think we have an opportunity to really have women's health in the broadest possible sense on that front burner. Thank you for putting it there. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. And I'm, I've got to apologize to the chair and ranking members. I had to step out uh, for a few minutes during their statements. Because a group of Jewish students at universities, including actually UCLA, UCLA and Stanford in your, in your home state, uh, you know, experienced blatant anti-Semitism on campuses. Uh, I'm sure you empathize with them, but let me bring it closer to home to HHS. Um, last December, the chief diversity officer at a major grantee, like this, this institution in my state gets over $800 million from HHS through the NIH issued a screed where she called Christians a privileged group. Now, that may not offend you, but that offends some people who got that. And it was university-wide to spread to, to the entire medical campus. Um, I'm sure you're aware under Title VII, 
that religion, you cannot discriminate based on religion at a employment when you employ more than 15 people. Do you think it's appropriate for the, for the Department of Health and Human Services to either directly fund a religious bigot uh, through, through NIH grants or an institution that hires a religious bigot to one of its highest levels of the administration? Dr. Harris, first let me begin by saying I think I can agree with pretty much everything you've just said with regard to the need for us to respect everyone, to not discriminate against anyone, especially whether it's race, religion, uh, national origin. Uh, and so I stand with you in that statement. Uh, and I would say to you that uh, when we look at a grantee, we look at those applications and we do thorough research to make sure that what we're doing is making an investment that taxpayers would be proud of. If there's a particular case that you think didn't meet that standard, please let us know, because we can only look at the application to figure out what that grantee was. So you're be. unaware of that case? I'm, I'm not aware of a particular case where, because of our funding, someone uh, is being discriminated no, against. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about giving hundreds of millions of dollars to an institution that hires a religious bigot onto their, fa onto their administrative staff. But anyway, that's, let's move on. I am so glad that in January you hosted HHS's first ever Food is Medicine Summit. Because I've been trying to make this point for years. Now, if food is medicine, junk food is bad medicine, right? You got to kind of... You're the doctor. Right? <laughs> All right. So um, if the scientific consensus is that, in fact, by restricting junk food and beverages, we might be able to help prevent di diet-related disease in low-income populations, do you believe that restricting, for instance, SNAP benefits to use on that those bad foods um, is a bad thing, and should we pursue a science-based policy to restrict those benefits? I, you know, I'm listening to what you just said, and I, I want to. I, I almost, you almost have me shaking my head in the affirmative because I don't see anything you said that I would disagree with. Obviously, we don't get to control oftentimes what gets included in some of these programs, but I would say to you that we are trying to move us towards. The, the fresh foods and the, the things that keep people healthy from the start. And so I want to make sure, because Dr. Harris, sometimes we don't agree, but I think I'm, where, I'm with you in what you said. I'm on a roll with you. We just agreed on a couple things, I think, in principle. Yes. By the way, I'd, I would love to work with you on That's, food as medicine. And I thank you, because I had the NIH uh, director in the office. She's willing to do it. The NIH has institutes with nutrition. This, I got to tell you, Ms. Seg, this is a no-brainer. Yeah. To me, it's a no-brainer. But anyway. Can I just mention let's you? Let's move on. Grocers. We, if grocers, if we can approach the grocers to okay. buy into this. Oh, so so big pharma is bad, but big grocers is OK. Is that no, no, right? No, no, what so, I'm saying. So, no, that that's the problem, is that big grocers oppose it. And you and you're the Secretary of Health, not the Secretary of Groceries. Let me go on to the, because I only have a minute left, the No Surprises Act, uh, you asked for another $500 million over 10 years to help implement it. Do you intend to use some of the additional implementation funding to enforce timely payments to providers? You know this is a problem, and I know you believe you need statutory authority. Yeah. Will you help us on that? Absolutely. I think what we're finding, we're, we're beginning to find the sweet spot. We've narrowed down the number of ineligible claims. We're trying to work closer with our uh, arbitrators so they don't feel overwhelmed. I think you're going to see good progress. Thank you. Uh, last question. Look, women's health is important. Does HHS intend to define women? Because I'm going to ask the NIH director the same question. When you, when you enroll people who have a, a Y chromosome and a single X chromosome in a study for women, you muddy the data for a wide variety of reasons. We, I can get into scientifically with 3,000 genes existing that are unopposed on those two, on those two chromosomes. Are you going to define women? So, Congressman, uh, we are in the business of trying to improve the health of Americans, and we're going to put out program, uh, uh, program proposals that give Americans a chance to improve their health. We're going to work with anyone who's got a good idea to improve Americans' health. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yield back. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for the job that you're doing. For those of us who had an opportunity to work with you uh, for over, well over a decade, maybe two decades. 24 years. 24 years, Congressman. 34 years? 24. 24 years. I knew you hadn't been here quite as long as I had been, but you've been here a long time. Yes. Thank you for your work that you did on the Ways and Means Committee and focused on issues that you're now dealing with as Secretary. 
and thanks for the work you're doing. Uh, you visited a Judy Center in our state in yeah. Baltimore City with me. It was a great visit, and uh, you are obviously very knowledgeable about the subject. Appreciate that. Let me ask you a, f a, a number of quick questions, uh, if you will. Primary care. Obviously, in the ACA, we focused on primary care. Uh, can you tell me about the investments that this budget makes in trying to extend primary care uh, to people, in particular uh, behavioral health issues as well? Uh, and uh, it's my understanding the budget provides three primary care visits uh, without any cost sharing uh, in, 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 this, in this legislation that you're proposing. Congressman, thanks for the question and for the work you've done on these issues. Uh, I will tell you that not only do we try to beef up the services, immediate services that people get, especially in preventative care, but we're going a little farther. Cancer screening. Folk, most folks don't think of preventative care as being cancer screening, especially if they're young. Well, I'm too young to get cancer. But screening is the way we're able to detect potential cancer fastest and save lives. And so we're going to really make a push on that. Vaccination, we've seen a drop off in vaccination. You've heard about the measles uh, contraction that's occurred in various parts of the country. We had eliminated measles in this country, but not as many kids are getting vaccinated. Vaccination protects you against the measles. Measles can be very dangerous. So we're doing a number of those efforts that will do basic, basic stuff that not only saves us money, but keeps people healthy. Okay, I'm going quick because the time yes. is brief. Uh, second question, Head Start. As you know, I've been very involved in Head Start for a very long period of time, very interested in Head Start. Uh, first of all, you mentioned 722, uh, 755,000 slots. How many children in America are eligible for Head Start? Do you know that off the oh, top of your head? It's about three or four times that number. Yeah. So we, we have slots for less than half of the children that would be That's correct. benefited by Head Start. That's that correct. was a program, of course, George H.W. Bush had succeeding Republicans and Democrats have thought was a program that worked well. Yes. On the other hand, how are we ensuring that it is spread to more rural areas uh, of the country? We are making an effort to try to find out where communities are under-resourced when it comes to Head Start programs, child care programs, and we're trying to get them to apply to get the programs in place. The difficulty oftentimes, as you know, Congressman, is in a rural area, in lower income areas, the costs are very expensive. And for states to try to sustain and support these centers, it's tough, especially during COVID. So many went out of business, tough to maintain the personnel. We're going to try to work with states to make sure that not only do we establish centers, but they can stay uh, in place as a good business. Thank you. I, I'm going to ask another question about Head Start, but I applaud you on your efforts to make that sure that early childhood uh, salaries are such that we can attract competent, capable people particularly at the early years of life, because that makes such a difference in terms of their long-term uh, prospects. Uh, let me ask you something. One of the things Donna Shalala did, from 1965 uh, to 1995, there was never a Head Start canceled for non-performance. I don't know what the pro process has been since Donna Shalala did that, but obviously we need to ensure that these Head Start centers that work if they are properly uh, operated, how are we making sure that these are uh, the centers we are funding work in a way that is effective for children? Perhaps the most important element of the president's proposal is to increase wages, because what we find is that centers that pay good wages have stable workforce. You have a stable workforce. You have committed people to those children. Uh, we find that in many rural communities, you have a pretty stable workforce because, again, it's small. There are not a lot of other options, and people are very committed to that. That's where you get some of the best results. And so we want to make it so that – and by the way, these are small businesses, these, uh, these uh, uh, child care programs. We need to make it so that they can survive and thrive as a business. And so as states look to open up more slots and establish more centers, we have to make sure that those centers can staff up with qualified people. Five minutes is such a superficial time to get into this. But uh, Lois Frankel, unfortunately, has the flu and could not be here today. But she wanted to ask a question that she's been asking the administration about the uh, availability uh, of contraception. Uh, you know, we wanted uh, contraception, but we now understand insurance companies are limiting it to certain uh, contraceptives, which are not necessarily the woman's choice. Can you speak to that? 
under the Affordable Care Act, which I had the pleasure to work with many of you on, uh, to pass. Uh, individuals are uh, have the right to receive preventative care services. Contraception services are included among the prevention, prevention services that the ACA protects. Under Section 1557 of the ACA, we have the uh, enforcement authority to uh, go to those insurers who are not providing women with their contraception coverage at no out-of-pocket cost. And so we have reached out to many of these insurers. We have heard the complaints, and we're trying to make sure they understand what their obligations are under the, under the law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for being here with us today and for your service to our country. Uh, last July, there was a TB outbreak that spanned seven states, including Michigan, and infected at least 36 patients. There was a CDC public health notice on the outbreak. Unfortunately, that TB infection has taken the life of a constituent of mine, as well as another uh, constituent of a representative in, in California. Uh, what was alarming is that this was an outbreak that was the second one in the past three years, and it had to do with uh, bone graft material from cadavers infected with TB. Uh, Chandra Isinga was my constituent. Uh, when I attended her funeral, uh, her family asked to make sure that this never happened again to anyone else. And I'm working on bipartisan legislation with uh, Congresswoman Dingell. Uh, we're working to address the situation, but I would just ask you, Mr. Secretary, for your full support and helping to make sure this never happens again. In this case, she was a woman who uh, had back surgery and um, wanted to be able to spend more time with family and, as a result, passed away from TB infection. Congressman, uh, those are the heartbreaking stories because you and I know it didn't need to happen. We're all in. However you think we can be supportive, please let us know technical assistance in your legislation or letting you know what we're doing to try to help tackle this. We'd love to be involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to switch topics, um, last week the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures Enterprise, which is the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response Chairs, released a multi-year budget. It's estimated that $2.389 billion is needed to supply and replenish the strategic national stockpile in 25, yet the President's current request to Congress is only $965 million, which is less than last year. Could you please explain why the request does not closely match the need outlined by Asper's own professional staff? Congressman, that's a great question because you all just swept up about $4 billion that we had in COVID funding, much of which would have gone to address some of these particular issues. Uh, we have to submit a budget that stays within the, the framework that you all have provided, which means we have to uh, downsize our request to meet our budget uh, uh, end, end game. And so that means that on something like preparedness, we're having to make the tough choices about what's the most important thing to do. But I would tell you, if you said our ASPR administrator, our uh, administrator for uh, uh, preparedness and response here today, she would let you know exactly what we would need. And we could use every additional resource you provide us. Is that going to be a priority to try and replenish those supplies? Because my understanding is um, there are decades old products there that, you know, it would, seems like we'd want updated uh, stocks. Yeah, absolutely. Let me give you a quick example. We have a, a lot of uh, uh, material in stock so that's warehoused that expires. And if we don't take care of it the right way, ref refrigeration or the rest, w it, we lose it even before its expiration date. We need to make sure we get funding just to be able to keep things frozen, keep things in room or the right temperature. And the budgets that we have to do these things, because COVID sh showed us we need to have real preparation in place, uh, we're sometimes making it really hard decisions on how to make this work. Okay, thank you. Um, wanted to talk with you a little bit about our regional health systems and local health plans are under a lot of pressure dealing with cha challenges, uh, rulemaking activities, payment notices. Uh, they're also experiencing the impact of the recent change healthcare cyber attack. 
One of the things that's come to my attention is that often uh, with respect to uh, CMS priorities, it seems that there's sort of a one-size-fits-all approach that has negative impacts on the community-based health services. I wonder if you could tell me what steps HHS is taking to ensure that its policies account for the diverse needs and circumstances of these critical health care providers. Congressman, we're working closely with most of the healthcare sector today because we know these cyber attacks are going to continue, and we're trying to help them understand where their vulnerabilities lie. And so we put out, in December, we put out a concept paper for the sector to comment on that really gives them a roadmap of where to go. We're going to continue to work with them because this change healthcare attack that essentially disabled about a third, if not more, of the sector when it came to getting payment and uh, being able to share medical records, we can't have that happen. And so we need everyone to be prepared, whether you're the largest hospital or the, the one-person doctor's office. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Uh, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. You know, you're the most accessible secretary in this administration and appreciate that um, whenever we have a question uh, you yourself are often uh, answering it and we appreciate that so thank you for being available uh, two areas i'd like to try to cover in the time first one is medicare and medicare advantage i know you're shocked uh, i want to talk about medicare advantage and then also about medicaid on medicare you have a strong budget proposal you've put together for the administration uh, you've got plans to extend the life of medicare and thank you for having that in the budget proposal. Specifically on Medicare Advantage, though, um, one of the areas I hear the most from constituents who have complaints is around Medicare Advantage. Two questions in Medicare Advantage. One, uh, we know that the overbilling, the overcharging by Medicare Advantage companies uh, is like something like $140 billion, enough to pay for Medigap insurance for every single person on Medicare. Is there more you can do without congressional authority to go after these companies to stop. And the second question in MA is you also have some proposed rules that are very strong, I think, to, to look at the industry to make sure. There's a particular part I'd like you to talk a little more about is prior authorization. We know that right now when people have to get prior authorization, the number of people that are told no, it's in the millions. Um, however, when they appeal that over 80% are, are allowed to proceed, which means delayed time is often delayed care for people. Could you just talk about those two aspects the, the $140 billion, anything else you can do on the overcharging and specifically on prior authorization. And so, Congressman, because I, I know some folks don't know the difference, but under Medicare, you can have what is con called traditional Medicare fee-for-service, where you could go to any doctor, any hospital you wish because you're a Medicare beneficiary. Uh, and then there is Medicare managed care, which is called Medicare Advantage, which says you sign up to be part of a network that that insurance company will provide you access to, but only there. You can't go outside a network. And the Medicare Advantage program, which you're referring to, uh, we're trying to provide, extract more transparency in the process because, as you said, it looks like we're ending up paying more per person, uh, Medicare recipient, who is in the Medicare Advantage program than we are for those uh, in, in equal settings in the fee-for-service program. So more transparency. We'd like to understand better how they make their decisions about prior authorization, so we're now requiring them to provide us with the background on the process they go through for prior authorization. And we're trying to make sure that they are working closer with the providers so that the providers understand what's expected of them so when they bill, they'll get paid. Do you know offhand what that percent is? I know it's over 80 percent, the number of... Uh, when they're appealed, the number that get turned back so that people actually get the care. Yeah, I, I don't want to give you a wrong number. I don't have it with me, but I could get you that. Okay, but it's over 80% if I remember. It's, this, it, you talk to any uh, beneficiary, any Medicare recipient in, in, in Medicare Advantage, and they'll tell you it's too high. Yeah, yeah. no, thank you. Um, also, Wisconsin, my state, is unfortunately one of 10 states that didn't do Medicaid um, expansion. expansion. And uh, one of the things is when the redetermination process uh, began last year, we had about 268,000 Wisconsinites lost coverage, including probably 185,000 people for procedural reasons uh, that meant they were still eligible, but not because of this um, redetermination process. Is there anything specifically that you're doing to help to make sure that those eligible in places like Wisconsin can still be enrolled? Yeah, we're, we're working as closely as we can with uh, the governors and with their Medicaid authorities in the state. And Governor Evers has been very good about working with us. Oftentimes what happens is the, the state's Medicaid 
uh, program doesn't have enough resources and wasn't prepared to deal with the big number of folks who had to go through the redetermination process. But we're working closely. Some states have employed what we call the ex parte process, which allows, especially for children, for them to be automatically re-enrolled. And then once the determination is made about eligibility, they can make decisions. But most of these kids will be eligible, so there's no reason to knock them off of coverage when at the end of the day, they'll, they'll end up getting Medicaid coverage. And is that related to part of the CHIP proposal that you have in the budget uh, for children? Our proposal actually would expand access to Medicaid to individuals in states like yours that had, did not expand Medicaid. So they will have access because we know that the folks most impacted by the, the loss in coverage under Medicaid redetermination are people who live in states that did not expand Medicaid. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'll actually yield back the 23 seconds. Wow. <laughs> Ms. Letlow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member DeLauro and Secretary Becerra. Thank you for your testimony today and for being here. I represent a largely rural district. It covers 24 parishes, uh, many of which are considered medical deserts. I believe it's crucial that we support programs that seek to address the severe health care crisis in rural America. That is a passion of mine. I look forward to partnering with you on that endeavor. Uh, my question. In the coming years, when we look back at COVID-19, we will always think of the effects on health as a result of delayed routine and preventative care, strained health care systems, and the increased mental health care crisis, which may be the worst of all for our children, especially those from low-income families who suffered significant harm during prolonged school closures, as well as the economic harm that upended many small businesses and communities. Mr. Secretary, you oversee the CDC, correct? Yes. Do you believe that the CDC has a public trust crisis at hand? A public trust? Public trust crisis. No. Okay. Well, according to the department's very own survey, in 2023, nearly 60% of Americans have serious lack of faith in the CDC. Mr. Secretary, what is the department's plan to engage with the public to restore faith in our public health institutions and the CDC? Congresswoman, great question, because I think you're right. Uh, although I think pretty much everybody these days, Congress, uh, everyone else, ranks pretty low in the eyes of so many Americans. And we do have to regain the faith. And what CDC is doing is they're trying to reach out more directly with communities by working directly with folks on the ground. We typically work with the state and their state health care offices because we don't control health care in the various states. So CDC partners. What we're trying to do, especially as, as a result of COVID, is go directly into communities because we have a ton of data that can help communities understand what's going on, where they live, and we'd like them to be able to have better sight to that. Uh, that's encouraging to hear. I, I spoke with the NIH director. She said that she was committed to going into rural communities like mine uh, to try to rebuild and restore that faith. And as you know, this is personal to me. Uh, I think back on the pandemic and lessons learned and what we would have done differently. Um, and many of us, rightly so, look to the CDC for guidance and advice. And it changed so often. And wherever I go in my district, in my communities, uh, they've completely lost faith. And so here's my fear for what happens during the next pandemic. And what is your plan moving forward uh, to restore that faith and prepare for the next pandemic? Uh, because, again, this is a personal question to me, and I want to make sure it's something that y'all are looking at, that what did you do wrong in the past, and how can we correct it, course correct it, moving forward? You know, we'd like to be able to connect the dots better. So, for example, one of the things that we did as we were trying to let communities know about availability of vaccines is we use trusted voices. Rather than have the CDC director, the secretary of HHS try to go out there and convince people what was available, we use folks that uh, people trusted. So whether it was the teacher, the, the barber, the clergyman, whoever had the faith and trust of community folks, we try to use them to have entree, to provide information. We would love to do more. If you're interested, I know that the CDC director would be more than willing to, to make a trip to speak to folks in, your, in the various communities, especially, by the way, rural communities, because it's not often that you get the director of CDC to go into a rural town or a small community in rural America. We'd like folks to know that we're accessible, probably best through their congressperson or perhaps through their county health uh, authority but we'll try to make sure that we connect the dots so people have the information and hopefully that builds the trust that the information they're getting is solid. 
Looking back now, is there anything you would have done differently? I, I think we would have worked closer with the state uh, health authorities more directly, quicker, because again, we don't have, the federal government doesn't do health care. We are only able to do health care when we're invited by the state health authorities to work with them because states control health care. And we were not as well connected as we could be. That's a, that's a function of our Constitution, which gives states the authorities to govern health. Mm -hmm. And when a crisis comes, we have national authorities to do much more. But it's, tar it's tough to build that connectivity overnight. Well, as someone who oversees the CDC, I look forward to seeing a comprehensive plan on uh, how you're going to address it. Uh, so we'll be prepared for the next round. I will let uh, Director Cohen know that you asked quite a few questions about Thank CDC. You. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I yield back. Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good to see you, uh, Secretary. Um, I'm, I tell you, I'm very encouraged by the President's proposed budget here, uh, particularly as it relates to women's health care, postpartum, um, pregnancy, disparities, children, you know, just all kinds of chock full of really good things, um, and, and things such as uh, negotiating down the, the, the price of um, prescriptions, which is vitally important to me. So I'm going to ask you three questions. I'm going to put them out there right now because I don't have a whole bunch of time. One of them is about PBMs, one is about long COVID, and one is about obesity. So with regard to PBMs, um, I want to know... What, what can the department do to, um, first of all, I want to know what PBMs do to actually create a, a, the lowering the costs of, of medication that gets to the patient. I really want to understand how they do this, what their role is. I want to understand their value added, if there is any. I want to understand um, what kind of oversight you all and guidance your agencies have been able to provide an accountability, because that is a very thorny issue with me. Um, with regard to uh, obesity, we have finally found a way to lose weight and not have to be hyped up on drugs and things of that nature. And there are several evidence-based uh, medications that are available to deal with the obesity. But in addition, we recognize that nutrition, access to information is vitally important. What are we doing to increase resources to that end, both to helping people to understand how to live a healthier life, and B, how to access those um, evidence-based medications through your insurance coverage? And then thirdly, I want to know about long COVID, because I'm continuously asked about it. I have no idea if I've got it. I know there are some things, of, you know, but I'd like to know um, I know there's $130 million or something like that that the uh, president is proposing with regard to long COVID. What are, we, what are we planning, and do we think we have enough? What do we actually need to be doing here? Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry to hit, the, hit you like that, but I only got three minutes. <laughs> let, me, let me try to address those, Congresswoman. I appreciate it because they're all ec excellent questions. On pharmaceutical, uh, pharmacy benefit managers, uh, Here's the tough part. They are middlemen. They are between the manufacturers of the drugs and the purchasers of the drugs, hospitals, uh, doctors. The uh, PBMs essentially determine at what price and to whom they go. And if you talk to community pharmacists, they will say PBMs are the main reason why so many of them are going out of business. So we're trying to get to the bottom of this, working with you all, because I know there are there is bipartisan legislation to try to really address reform on PBMs. Everyone is interested in transparency. Most of us would like to see more consumer protections so that consumers don't end up paying higher prices for their drugs than necessary. And we want to make sure that we prohibit uh, the, uh, the kind of in interference that gets in the way of actually getting the drug to the person who needs it as quickly as possible. And so we're doing what we can to try to give technical assistance to those who are coming up with the legislation. We're somewhat constrained by law because we don't, we don't uh, oversee PBMs. They're a, they're a creation mm -hmm. of the manufacturers and the uh, insurers, the insurance companies. And so what we're trying to do is have greater insight to what they're doing on obesity. You know, I, I, I'm reminded of, I always talk about a great American who said, 
it is easier to build strong children to, than to repair broken men. That was Frederick Douglass. He said that about 160 years ago. We spend billions of dollars trying to repair broken men and women instead of building strong children. To your point about obes obesity, obesity is preventable for the most part, and we should be doing far more to keep people from becoming obese. Fortunately, we are finding new medicines that help us treat obesity. The difficulty for some is they can't afford them. And in the case of Medicaid, it's up to a state whether or not it will uh, provide uh, payment for obesity uh, drugs. In the case, case of Medicare, as you know, Medicare has a statutory prohibition from using Medicare funds to pay for weight loss uh, mm -hmm. uh, drugs. And so we have to work with you to see what we can do. But clearly, the first thing we should do is make sure we're preventing people from becoming obese. Secondly, help treat people so that whether it's because of diabetes or other reasons, we have to deal with so, these issues. So visits to providers of information ought to be considered eligible for coverage as well. Yeah, I, well, again, I, yeah. We have to work with states on Medicaid. We have yeah. to work with you to change the law if you like to with regard to Medicare. But clearly there are medicines out there, but there are also programs out there that don't rely on medicines to help you keep from gaining weight. I didn't get to long COVID, I apologize. Long COVID is my last issue, sir. We have the premier uh, research project underway at the NIH to address long COVID, what it is, what it, what it does, how to treat it. Thank you. I wish that I could stay for a second round because I've got so many questions, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Clyde. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chairman, for holding this hearing today. Secretary Becerra, I'm deeply disturbed by reports that your agency, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the sub-agency Office of Refugee Resettlement has mishandled the flood of unaccompanied alien minors entering our country by one, not properly vetting the minor, and two, by placing them in the hands of unvetted sponsors. Your agency is responsible for ensuring that the sponsors of these children will care for and support these unaccompanied children through the Unaccompanied Alien Children Program, and your agency is responsible for ensuring that these children do not become victims of trafficking or exploitation. Is that correct? Congressman, while they're in our custody, we have an obligation to protect them, and we do. There is not a child that you can name that has been uh, exploited or, or used for labor while they're in our custody. Okay. Um, but, while they're, but when you send them to a sponsor, is it not your responsibility also to ensure that the sponsors of these children will care for and support these unaccompanied children? And Congressman, that's where I turn the question back over to you because you, you, had, you Congress, did not give us authority to have jurisdiction over those children once, once we have uh, dispatched them to a vetted sponsor. So the, the answer is, no, we don't have authority or jurisdiction over that child, and you have not given us any authority. So we cannot, as you know, by law, under the Constitution, I can't use a single dollar that you all give me to try to help monitor that child once they leave our care because by by Constitution, I cannot spend a dollar for something you haven't authorized me to do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think we have a little different viewpoint on that right there. But Congressman, there's no, there's no dispute here. We don't have uh, statutory authority to go beyond uh, care for that child w once they leave our custody. And we've mentioned this on many occasions. It, it, it makes it difficult for us. We do a few things voluntarily if we have the monies to do them to try to see if we can monitor them once we release them. But there, those, those children and their sponsors are under no obligation to even respond back to us. Okay. All right. <clears throat> you told Chairman Adderholt that over 300,000 UACs have been processed since the beginning of the Biden administration. Is that correct? Yeah, I could get you a precise number later. I, I would like that precise number. We'll get that to you. And you also said that you do voluntarily follow up on them. We try to, yes. You try to, yes. okay. Um, what percentage are you actually able to connect with? We make a commitment. It's not a statutory obligation, but we make a commitment to try to follow up with every child that we place with at least three phone calls to this child and three phone calls to the sponsor. We'd say three because we know that oftentimes we won't get to anybody in the first call or the second call. And so we try at least three times with child and sponsor. We also then provide them with information on where, what they can do once they're in the care of a sponsor if they need follow-up services. And certainly for anyone where there is any suspicion of abuse or neglect, 
we, we try to make sure that they're aware that they can call a hotline number where we will try to make sure they get assistance. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would like uh, to request unanimous consent to enter into the record. This article from the New York Times, February 25th, 2023, says, alone and exploited migrant children work brutal jobs across the United States. Have you seen that article? Congressman, my dad left the sixth grade to start working because that was what he had to do to feed the family. So I'm very aware of the fact that a lot of young children, especially migrant children, end up working to help support a family. Without objection, that will be entered into the record. Thank you. Um, in this article, it says, uh, it quotes you from 2021 saying, we don't want to continue to see a child languish in our care if there is a responsible sponsor. Okay, well, let's talk about that responsible sponsor. According to reporting from the New York Times, HHS has, quote, pared back protections that have been in place for years, including some background checks and reviews of children's files. According to the HHS Office of the Inspector General, these policies have resulted in the failure of HHS to conduct required safety checks, including even sex offender address and name checks. Secretary Becerra, has HHS rolled back any vetting requirements of sponsors for UACs? Congressman, we have not rolled back protections that would keep a child safe. We have constantly evolved our processes to meet the needs of the kids as we have them, but we have not rolled back safety protections uh, which would harm any child. Okay, does HHS check to ensure that every sponsor of an unaccompanied minor child is not a registered sex offender? We go through the, uh, reg well, we go through the public registries for sex offenders. What about the people that live with the sponsor? We go through the... So as I mentioned before in, a, in, a, in answer to a previous question, if depending on who the sponsor is, if it's the parent, for example, we, are, we go through the process to uh, verify that this is an individual who really is a parent or a close family relative. Mm -hmm. If it is a close family relative, then we don't do the ex more extensive background checks. They're still extensive, but for someone who's not a family member, we'll go in and make sure people who are in the household, we check them as well because we we can't trust that if you're not the parent, you're going to be as uh, caring for that child. So we do far more than what we do with regard to the vetting for an, uh, a primary uh, family member. Well, I'm happy to hear that. If it's one thing I want to make sure, it's that, the, um, that uh, Health and Human Services uh, is not the last link in the chain of child trafficking. I appreciate that. And Congressman, we'd be more than willing to give you a briefing on the process that we undertake because we have the different categories of kids, those who have an immediate family member, those who have a family member but not so immediate, those who we have been who have identified to have someone who is a close friend of the family or a trusted name. Sometimes we get them from the family back in the home country. And then there's kids that we find no one who's close. So those various categories under, uh, undergo a different type of vetting, the sponsors do, because we trust that a parent is going to care for that child far more than someone who says they're a friend. Thank you, Mr. and I yield back. Mr. Siskamani. Thank you, Mr. Ch <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Becerra, for being with us today, for coming to testify. Uh, as you know, the, the U.S. has large disparities in health outcomes among U.S. women. We talked a bit about that right now, and minority populations as well. Uh, when compared to men. And as a, a father of, of three girls, I've, uh, I never want to see my, my daughters face uh, undue challenges because of their gender or, or their race. And that goes for healthcare research uh, to job opportunities as well. So uh, uh, my question is, you know, despite making up uh, more than half of the population, women have been historically understudied and underrepresented in health research, as well as being chronically underfunded. And uh, I'm concerned. Uh, I, I'm concerned many of the diseases we are focused on today, such as Alzheimer's and uh, cardiovascular disease, impact women to a far greater extent. In light of this, how does HHS plan to advance women's health research across the agency to prevent, diagnose, and also treat health conditions in women? Congressman uh, Sisk, money uh, as a father of three daughters as well. I uh, I feel for you because. Uh, <laughs> You, you have to sometimes go without the, 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 the kisses and hugs that you get from those three daughters probably every day you're around. True all the way. Yes. And you're going to love, I don't know how old yours are, but mine are now in their 20s and they're gems. In fact, I, one of them was in this room for a while. Um, you're a lucky man. <laughs> and uh, what I will tell you is that 
this president has given us an opportunity to really focus in on women's health and women's health research. This week, uh, the president announced through an executive order that we're going to double down on doing health research. Quick thing I learned, women athletes, uh, for the most part, the athletic uh, apparel they wear, whether it's their shoes or their jerseys, are simply downsized versions of the men's uh, uh, shoes and jerseys. Women's uh, feet are very different from men. Their arches are different, but yet they have to wear, uh, wear for a professional athletic uh, activity, shoes that were designed for men. Jerseys, I found out that the, uh, the Spirit, I think is the name of the team, the soccer team here, women's soccer team here in Washington, D.C., their jerseys are just smaller men's jerseys. They, it, it goes to that extent that not only have we not done the research on uh, heart disease, which attacks women more than men, but we don't even make sure that the, our athletes, our greatest athletes, are getting the kind of equipment they need. We have to do more. If you're, very, if you're interested in that, we'd love to chat with your team about what we're doing and how we could use your support. Yeah, that, that was the full, the full nature of the question. And you know, to begin to tackle the, the, this health disparity, we need to begin with how agencies collect data, I think, as well. You know, uh, I don't know if you were aware that uh, only about 5% of clinical trials even report the number of participants by sex. So uh, how much of your budget is going to focus on women's health research specifically? Well, the, the president's budget actually increases by several hundred million the focus on women's research. And we have a particular pro project, and I hope you're familiar with ARPA-H, the new program that's similar to DARPA at the Department of Defense. They have what they call a, uh, a sprint on women's health. And what we're doing uh, is we're going to reach out to private sector companies, usually small businesses that are having difficulty finding capital to move their project forward. And we're going to see which one of them. It's sort of like a shark tank. And we're going to invest in some of these private sector uh, uh, innovators to see what we can move forward. And it's going to be on women's health research. Well, I do want to take you up on the specific briefing on that. Uh, one more question. While on the topic of women's health here, I, I specifically want to ask about the department's focus on maternal health. Yes. Uh, a critical component is having safe medications and therapeutics that can be used during pregnancy. Uh, but despite 90 percent of the pregnant women taking medications, less than 5 percent of medications have any data and how it impacts women during pregnancy or her baby. Like I mentioned, you and I talked about, I'm a, I'm a dad of three girls. I'm also a, a dad of three boys. So I've, I've been with my wife through th six different pregnancies. And then to think that mothers um, uh, are likely taking medications that have never been studied on pregnant women, uh, that's, that's concerning. So wh wh what is the agency doing to begin studying common medications uh, and therapeutics taken by, by pregnant women? We are, uh, and the focus of the Women's Health Research Initiative is to absolutely make sure that not only are women included in, in general research projects, but that there are those that are spe specifically geared towards their health and their conditions so we understand them better. Why is it that women seem to get Alzheimer's at a greater rate than men? Uh, those are the kind of questions that these initiatives will ha actually help us answer, and we'd love to have you on board, and, and congratulations on the three boys as well. <laughs> well, I, I definitely am on board. I want to make sure that we are uh, – the, the disparity is here between the percentage of, of the research that we're actually conducting and, 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 uh, and the percentage of women getting these diseases is, is quite astounding. So um, the numbers have been there for a while. Uh, this is not any new information to any of us, so we need to tackle that issue immediately. If, uh, uh, you know, that would be my suggestion. We'll reach out to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. LeTurner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Secretary, welcome today. We have seen a surge in recent years of youth mental health issues. And we are seeing in particular that children's use of social media is impacting their mental health. Many companies are more interested in making money off kids than protecting them, sadly. The data is alarming. For example, the rate of eating disorders has doubled amongst adolescent girls and children's hospitals are seeing a surge of children showing up with serious mental health issues, including a 67% increase in referrals at Children's Mercy in my own state. The NIH has begun working on a study to better understand the impacts of social media on mental health. Are there any current findings that you can share with us today? 
Uh, I'd like to tell you that we've had some definitive research done and we can give you findings, but I'm not aware of it. I can make sure we check with NIH, and if you'd like us to follow up with you, we can. But we are abs I think there's not more just NIH, but a number of agencies, a number of private sector and academic research institutions are trying to look into this as well. Well, that's what I want to talk about. What is HHS doing to prevent research and intervene early when a child is struggling with their mental health, especially in the case of serious mental illness like eating disorders? Uh, I can give you, I can try to make sure we respond back with the, the different projects that are underway, research projects underway at NIH, and we can certainly make sure that our, our agency, our SAMHSA agency, the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration, also follows up with you because they're the ones that are doing the more direct services to communities today. And so, for example, when you all passed a bipartisan bill on, uh, domestic, on gun violence and provided monies for mental health services, uh, SAMHSA was the agency that was charged with trying to dispense those dollars best. I would love some of those, uh, we'll follow those answers. That would be helpful. The crisis of antimicrobial resistance, yes. or AMR, threatens modern me medicine and is currently a leading cause of death worldwide. I'm encouraged that the administration recognizes AMR is a serious and urgent threat to patients and public health by including a proposal that aligns with the bipartisan, bicameral uh, Pasture Act, which I'm proud to co-lead in the House, to encourage the development of innovative antimicrobial drugs and ensure we are armed with an adequate supply of properly stewarded antimicrobial products against highly dangerous drug-resistant microbes. Can you describe your budget proposal on antimicrobial uh, subscriptions in more detail, including uh, an expected timeline for implementation? Yeah. Uh, first, Congressman, I, I, we don't know each other well, but I'd love to give you a hug because there just aren't enough members of Congress who, who want to touch this issue of antimicrobial resistance. And in so many ways, as you know, people are dying at rates that sometimes surpass COVID. And we have an obligation to make sure people are safe and we don't lose quality medicines because they're not used properly or they're overused. Uh, and we don't prepare for the next bacteria that may come at us really hard. And so what we're trying to do is very, very similar to what you're proposing in the Pasteur Act is figure out a way to make it worthwhile for manufacturers of these medicines to stay in the game because many of these medicines, as you know, don't have a lot of profit behind them. And so it's tough for a business to stay afloat trying to sell drugs that don't, you can't sell for very much money and often aren't needed until there's a crisis. And so the subscription model, which says everyone will buy in and start to try to do the manufacturing, give us a, an industry that can be available they can do that because we'll have a subscription model where everyone pays in early so there's money to be had so you don't have to wait till there's a crisis to know that you get paid for your good work in manufacturing a particular medicine. I appreciate that. Of the over 100 million Medicaid enrollees, approximately 40 million are able-bodied adults. Over the past several years, your administration has revoked multiple waivers, allowing states to test work requirements for these able-bodied adults on Medicaid. At the same time, we've seen data from state Medicaid agencies indicating that many of these same able-bodied adults are not working at all. We've had work requirements as a core principle for participants in the TANF program for decades now. What is your opposition to allowing states to experiment with policies to move these adults from welfare to work? And so, Congressman, let me make sure I'm clear, because you mentioned both TANF, uh, well, the welfare program, and Medicaid which is a healthcare program. So tell me where you want me to focus. Well, fo I'll focus specifically on the uh, on your revoking multiple waivers, allowing the states uh, to test work requirements. So this is in regards to Medicaid, which offers waivers to the states. The 1115 waivers. 1115 waivers are part of the Medicaid program within C the CMS agency. Uh, the waivers are provided to states, and just to make sure it's clear, Medicaid has certain laws that Congress has passed and how we implement Medicaid and how we get resources to states to implement the program that's principally for lower income Americans to have access to doctors and hospitals. Medicaid, it's a matching program. Where if, I'm running out of time. Get, oh, I'm sorry. Get, get okay. to the core of my question, okay. which, is, which, which is my observation that there seems to be an opposition to allowing states to uh, test things like work requirements. Sure. Uh, the Medicaid program's focus is on health care, making sure health care is improved. If you look throughout the Medicaid statutes, you won't find a single word that says work requirements. And what we do is we make sure that any proposal 
by a state, whether it's direct uh, Medicaid uh, servicing or through a waiver of those servicing requirements, that the health of that individual who will be impact, impacted by the waiver improves. And so that's what we look at. We don't look at any other thing. A state may want to try to do other things, which is fine. But our purpose is to make sure if you're going to ask for a Medicaid dollar, that it, when it is applied to that individual in your state, it improves the health of that individual. And so that's what we look at. And if certain waivers are retracted, it's because we're not seeing results. And taxpayers have a right to demand results when states spend taxpayer dollars. I'll tell you what's good for uh, people's health also is, uh, is understanding the dignity and pride that comes with work and not allowing states to uh, pursue this and to have the opportunity to observe what works in one state and what may not work so that we can have best practices um, is, is not a good thing. And so I hope, I, I hope that you will uh, rethink your position on this. I just want to make sure we're clear. We don't stop any state from... Uh, my question was very clear. Your well, answer gentle, wasn't so much. time's but expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Mr. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate you being with us this afternoon. Congratulations on uh, your uh, assignment to the committee. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be among this group of uh, who's who congressmen right. and women up, up, up here. Uh, in, th in this year's State of the Union address, President Biden said that he would be directing his cabinet to review the federal classification of marijuana. Have you had any conversation with the president uh, to, to this date on the classification of marijuana? The, the only communication that we've, I've had uh, with the president directly on this is when he issued his uh, directive to us to uh, evaluate uh, cannabis and report back to the D Drug Enforcement uh, Agency on this. And, and so the news reports that I've been able to, uh, to look at indicate that you've already taken a position that uh, marijuana should be, I'm going to say decriminalized, but... Uh, descheduled. Yeah, descheduled from a Class 1 to a, to a, to a Class 3. Right. So, so it can you, still be a, a criminal violation depending on its use. Yeah. But wouldn't you agree that between that declassification and President Biden's statement, uh, because I w believe that he did go on to say uh, in his State of the Union address that it shouldn't be, and I'm not quoting him exactly, it shouldn't be such a crime to uh, possess marijuana. So, uh, but between those two things, wouldn't you think that that would make marijuana more available to uh, the, the, the citizens of our country, particularly youth? Well, I, and Congressman, I don't know about in your state, but in my state of California and probably more than half of the states of the nation, uh, marijuana is already somewhat available, whether for medical purposes or even for recreational purposes. What we're talking about here is, though, the federal treatment of, of marijuana, of cannabis, because federal law treats uh, cannabis differently than most states. And what the president asked us to do is examine where we are with cannabis today at the federal level. And as you're aware, Right now, cannabis is listed, is scheduled as a uh, 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 schedule, I'm going to get it wrong, fiber one, one, yes, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Harris, a schedule one, which means the most potent and dangerous right. type of narcotic. So I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm going to run out yes. of time here yes. in, in just a minute. I've got a couple more questions okay. that, that, that I'd like to get to. And the whole issue of the states uh, implementing law in a, uh, contrary to uh, federal law is a Whole nother discussion maybe we can have at, an, at, at another time. Okay. But I find it very conflicting to look in your report that you provided to this committee. And I'll, I'll, I'll read a, a, a sentence or so. The budget also addresses the sobering impact of the behavioral health crisis on our nation's youth. National surveys of youth have shown significant increases in certain mental health symptoms including depressive symptoms and suicidal ideation. And yet, much of the research that I see uh, indicates that the use of marijuana creates these tendencies. Are, are you aware that according to the CDC, people who use marijuana are more likely to develop temporary psychosis real hallucinations and paranoia, and long-lasting mental disorders, including schizophrenia. Uh, and they, 
the association between marijuana and schizophrenia is stronger in people who start using marijuana at an earlier age and use marijuana more frequently. Are you, are you aware of that report, a report I, similar to that? I'm aware of a number of reports and studies. Uh, when I was the Attorney General in California, we dealt with the issue of marijuana. Uh, and as the Secretary, I've worked closely with the Food and Drug Administration, which is the one, is the agency charged with making a determination about the scheduling, uh, well, recommending scheduling of marijuana. And are, are you aware of a 2021 NIH study that suggests a link between cannabis use and higher levels of uh, suicidal ideation? ideation uh, plans and, and, and attempts? Uh, the various studies you're probably referring to are the types of uh, studies and reports that the Food and Drug Administration would have taken into consideration as it did as a, its assessment of cannabis. And, and, and thank you. And so you're aware of those reports out there. I, I have a real concern that in light of the mental health issues that we have today that our federal government, the Department of Health and uh, Human Services and President Biden are considering descheduling a substance that is far more potent today than it was when any of y'all ever used the, 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 the drug that will contribute more to uh, depression, suicidal tendencies, schizophrenia, and, and those types of things. And so... I, w I would urge you, and I will uh, say that I'll continue to resist any effort to make these types of substances more available to our youth today, uh, where in your report you go on to say we need more money to, to, to treat. That seems very contradictive to me. And so with that, thank you. Appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Secretary, we'd like to do a second round if you're available. At your bidding, sir. All right. Appreciate that very much. And I'm going to yield my time to Dr. Harris, and then we'll go to Ms. DeLauro. Thank you very, thank you very much. And, and I'll be um, uh, brief because it is approaching the noon hour. Um, let me follow up on what Mr. Edwards said because I think he's absolutely right. You know, in front of this subcommittee, Dr. Volkow, kind of works for you, uh, has come and said it's just a bad idea. I mean, you know, recreational marijuana is just a bad idea and brings up the fact about brain development and youth and things, things that uh, Mr. Edwards brought up. So I, I have a concern when the HHS kind of with both, with both arms hugs this idea of, uh, of reducing the scheduling. I also have the concern about the international treaties, the 1961 UN Single Convention, of course, 1988 uh, Convention Against Illicit Traffic in Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances, which some people, I know there's disagreement, some people think we would be violating our international treaty agreements. Now, given that this administration is all in for a treaty agreement with the World Health Organization on pandemic uh, things that would, you know, give up our rights as states in a free nation, uh, I'm a little surprised that they, uh, you know, want to have this, uh, this beef with the World Health Organization on the single conventions. But I'll leave it at that. Uh, I have a disagreement with the, with the uh, uh, department. Uh, proposed rule change governing the temporary assistance for needy families, the TANF program that eliminates pregnancy resource centers. And it, and it specifically uh, says that, you know, they don't fulfill the three purposes. That can only be written by someone who hasn't been in a pregnancy resource center. They fulfill all three purposes uh, that we require for funding. 80% of Americans agree with the idea that you should have a resource uh, for women who feel they might be in need, and the excuse that it only helps women, quote, help women only after they become pregnant, again, is just not true with regards to anyone who's visited a uh, pregnancy resource center, um, and and we'll, I'll follow up with some uh, with some uh, QFRs on that. Finally, and to end, um, I am so glad that you agree. We're going to agree on something else. Women athletes are actually different than men athletes. You actually said that their foot structure is different between a woman and a man. Well, that's interesting because my my uh, daughter was a uh, six-time All-American track and field uh, person, and I'm convinced that if she had to com uh, compete against someone, a man thinks they're a woman now, whose foot structure is different, that puts her at a competitive disadvantage. I don't care what kind of shoe she wears. I mean, she's at a, at a structural competitive disadvantage because women athletes are different than men athletes, period, full stop. So are you investigating that as well in addition to like what shoes an athlete might wear, like whether or not it's actually fair to let men compete with women in women's sports to undo all the things we've done 
to get women competitive, to, to get the ability to compete in college sports, get athletic scholarships, are you going to help us not throw that all under the bus? Or is it just going to be about sneakers? It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Um, Mr. Laurel. Thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, a couple of questions. One on public health. And public health, as you know, is just not about infectious diseases. We've got foodborne outbreaks, cancer prevention, safe drinking water. The committee in the past has made significant investments in our public health infrastructure, um, public health data modernization, public health workforce. And uh, sometimes it's not understood that 80% of the CDC's budget goes to our public health partners. Um, that's the state and local health departments. And these departments rely on the funding for their activities and the impact uh, uh, that impact all of our communities because uh, they need to be response ready when something happens. So we need to not backslide on our public health uh, investments. Um, uh, so we need to uh, 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 understand what's going on in our communities and it is the public health departments that are on the front line. As you travel the country, what do you hear from state and local departments? How do you see the federal investments impacting the role that they play at the local level? Congresswoman, one of the things that I hear all the time is that uh, the coordination that we saw when we were in crisis mode with COVID really brought uh, states and the federal government together to try to address the needs of our people. That, but that absent that type of crisis or emergency, we don't work as well together as we should. And the coordination is something that CDC is trying to uh, maintain. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's data sharing, and I don't know if folks understand this, but uh, except for the public health emergency, when it came to having data on COVID, who was getting sick, who was dying, no. we, didn't have a, we didn't have the authority to have that information. Mm -hmm. We had a, re, we, usually we have to request it because of the public health emergency, we had authority, emergency authority to say, you must provide us with this data. Mm -hmm. Uh, we would love to be able to coordinate better with our, our state and local part, health care partners. Uh, and the more we do, the better off Americans will be. Yeah, thank you. Because I, And this committee, as I said, made significant investments in the public health infrastructure, which is what you're talking about. We know during the pandemic, the public health infrastructure almost collapsed uh, uh, on us. And that's why I'm very concerned that we not backslide on that public health investment. So I appreciate of the efforts and look forward to working with you on that and to make it more known, and particularly to members, the role that their state and, uh, and local uh, uh, health departments have with the CDC. 80% of the budget goes there. So, so thank you. Uh, last question is on behavioral health. Uh, and I'm so pleased to see you focus in that area. Uh, I, I've seen it, the positive impact of uh, 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 substance use in our, we have peer review, counselors, now crisis response teams around the country, one in my own hometown of New Haven, Connecticut. Um, uh, the other area is I'm a longtime supporter of the National Child Traumatic Stress Initiative that looks at the mental uh, health care for kids. Um, I was able to visit one of the programs in my district and impressed by their positive impact. Uh, this subcommittee has made behavioral health, I might add, a major priority, including the doubling for SAMHSA over the last eight years from $3.8 billion to roughly $7.6 billion. And my question, Mr. Secretary, uh, behavioral health uh, is complex. It requires serving people over the course of their lifetimes. How does the budget request propose to address the variety of behavioral health needs of our country? Yeah. Excellent question, Congresswoman. And I would tell you that one of the things we're doing is trying to go outside the box. So we're trying to make sure that primary care physicians, family care doctors actually get training in behavioral health so that while they may not become specialists in behavioral health, psychiatrists, psychologists, they have some training so they can identify issues faster. Because right now what we see is you go in to see your family care doc, your doc says, ah, oh, you know, I can see that Johnny's got some issues. But we're gonna, I'm going to refer you to the specialist. And then you have to wait two more months before you see the specialist. 
as opposed to having a doctor who says, I, I recognize some of that. I'm not, a, I'm not a specialist, but I recognize it. So here's what we're going to do. And we want folks to be trained as primary care family docs to be able to quickly address behavioral so we don't treat it like a, a stepchild to physical health. We're also trying to make sure that we have more graduate medical education slots, the, the residency programs that are in behavioral health. So we drive more doctors and nurses into the behavioral health sciences. So this way we beef up the workforce because we're in so uh, desperate need of, of more people, especially in rural and underserved communities. Th thank you very much. I think this is the Department of Education. But if we had mental health counselors, if we had counselors in schools, that's a first line as well. Yes. Look at that and put resources there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Letlow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Secretary, I know you've addressed uh, some of these concerns, but I want to circle back to it. Uh, according to your own department's Office of Inspector General's OIG report from last month, I have a copy here in February, the Office of Refugee Resettlement often transferred unaccompanied children to adult sponsors in the U.S. without thorough screening. Additionally, the report alleged that HHS neglected to conduct timely safety assessments after the children were released. The findings revealed that 16% of child case files lacked documentation of sponsor background checks by ORR. This is extremely disappointing. As a mom, myself, it's my deep concern that many of these children fall victim to child labor and sex trafficking. Mr. Secretary, I'm a mom. You're a father, correct? Yes. Do you share my concerns in this? Congresswoman, um, not just for my kids, but for any, any child, uh, we owe them a great deal more attention and the services that we would expect for our own children. So I absolutely agree that we have to do as much as possible. Okay. Uh, you mentioned to uh, my colleague, Congressman Clyde, that they do background checks on all adults and sponsor households before releasing the children. I believe the truth is that you all only started doing that after this OIG report came out this year, exposing them for not properly screening kids. Is that correct? No, no, that's not correct. Okay. We, we, we have done them. background checks from the very beginning. Now, what I will tell you, and because you re referenced an OIG report that was from 2021, and it covered, a, I think, about a two-month period, which was when we were seeing the height of the influx of children. And because, as I mentioned before, our obligation is to place them in the care of a, a sponsor because it's always better to be in a family setting than in a congregate care setting for any child, especially very young children. We have an obligation by law to try to place them. And so we were going through the process of trying to make sure we did it efficiently but safely. And so what we are now experiencing is a very different situation. And what we have learned over the course of these last few years is how to make sure we do it as good as possible. And so that's why we now have different categories of kids and how we treat them in trying to vet their sponsors. And so we continue to learn. We appreciate the work that the OIG did to give us recommendations. In almost every case, we have either completed or are on the way to completing many of the recommendations because at that point, we were flying the plane while it was still in repair. And what we are now doing is making the best use of everything we've learned to make sure best practices are being applied for these children. Okay, well, that's a, a nice segue to my next question because it's my understanding that we have shattered the record for migrants crossing the border illegally with over 2 million just last year. So would it be accurate to say that HHS and ORR are overwhelmed with processing and vetting placements for these children? No. Okay. Today, no. Okay, I beg to differ. It's been reported that ORR has lost contact with over 85,000 children. That seems that ORR is overwhelmed or that they are not doing their job. I have a simple solution to solve this crisis and that is for the administration to secure the border and enforce our immigration laws. With that, I yield back. Mr. Hoyer. Um. The problem with simple solutions are they're usually not correct, uh, although I share the view that we need to slow very, very substantially uh, those who come in, and we need to fix the immigration system, and it is very sad that uh, a bipartisan proposal that was put forward was tanked by the person who wants to be president of the United States, um, not the incumbent, and it's a sad thing. The other observation, I, Mr. Edwards, I, I would make to you. Um, I don't do this for applause or, or detraction. I've never smoked. I've never had marijuana. 
I've never had any other drug uh, other than prescription drugs, uh, and I don't drink alcohol. I happen to believe, I, I represent the tobacco growing area, Maryland, however, Southern Maryland, which does not grow tobacco any longer, took the buyout. Uh, but I think that cigarette smoking is far more lethal and costly to the country and to human beings uh, than is marijuana. Uh, our state has legalized marijuana by a vote of the people. Uh, I don't know how many states, but you refer to half the states somewhere in that neighborhood. So I think it is somewhat ironic that we are focused on a less lethal drug according to the medical community, marijuana, which I have never used, don't intend to use, and urge my daughters and, and not to use, uh, and cigarettes, which I also urge them not to use. Unfortunately, uh, two of them do. Uh, I, I make that observation because uh, I think that uh, it is clear for whatever reasons the American people in every state in which it's been voted, including Mississippi, I don't know about North Carolina, probably not North Carolina, um, have uh, voted pretty handily to uh, authorize that substance. And the, as a result, where we find ourselves is in a contradictory situation between the state's legalization and the federal government's. Uh, particularly, there's a bill that's been pending I've been strongly for, not because I'm for uh, selling marijuana per se. I'm not necessarily for making it illegal because people are going to use it, do use it, and then get incarcerated for what is being used generally by the public and apparently approved generally by the public that's voted on it. Um, but we have a banking system that does not accept at the federal level uh, dollars that are being legally uh, earned uh, in states that have legalized uh, the sale but they don't have any place to deposit. I think that's a dangerous situation that's leading to a lot of cash hanging around people's businesses that is subject to being stolen and, and, and their places broken into. I'd say that as an aside just because I think it is uh, uh, somewhat contradictory and, and confusing for the public uh, and harmful for the, for, the, for the public as well. Let me go back to Head Start. I'm very interested in Head Start. Judy, you went to the Judy Center. Judy, my wife, headed up Head Start, it was about 20% of the Head Starts in America are in the Department of Education. 80% of them are in social service agencies. I think they ought to all be in education. So that's my own view, because kids are ready to learn at three years old. They were ready to learn at two. They were ready to learn at one. But we had a concept in 1965 when Head Start was established that children being exposed to education before the age of five or six would have too much pressure on them. Hillary Clinton and, 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 and scientists and educators have all said that that's not true. Uh, but I'm also concerned in looking at this, I, th I, th I think the figure is um, either eight billion, I, I had it here, let me see, uh, or nine billion, uh, eight, eight billion child care development block grant and 11 billion, almost 12 billion, and increased to 12 billion in the Head Start program. <clears throat> Ms. Secretary, this is not a question so much as an observation and an encouragement. Uh, that's a lot of money we're spending. I think we're spending it in the right place, but I think in, there are some places where it is not being used very efficiently and effectively to the end that those children, uh, you, you, you count Frederick Douglass, easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. That's absolutely right. And we have to make sure that that $11 billion and $9 billion, that's $20 billion, is being spent to the benefit of those children. And I will say, and it's gonna be controversial, I know some people can get on my back about it, but there's some programs that are not being carried out to the benefit of children as they should be. And we need to look at that because that's a lot of cash we're putting on the table. It's, a, it's, a, it's necessary to do. Uh, and it's critically important for those children that they're getting the best that we can give them and getting the best results for them as well as for the taxpayers' expenditure of that money. That's not a question, but it is. As I say, I was amazed when Donna Shalala told me, sitting where you're sitting now, in 1966, excuse me, uh, in uh, 1986, that we had been from 65 uh, to 95, or 95, 90 to 96, 95, mm -hmm. without ever canceling a program for non-performance. I can tell you, because of Judy's experience, 
nationally, there were some programs that didn't work for children. I hear you. And we need to make sure they do. Thank you. Mr. Clyde. Thank you. Um, in uh, in follow-up to my previous questions, I want to talk about um, uh, the issue of properly vetting the minor now, all right? Because not only do we need to protect the unaccompanied alien minor from exploitation, but we also need to protect American citizens from any potentially dangerous individuals who are entering the United States through the unaccompanied alien children's program. Mr. Secretary, are you aware that HHS has processed minors with criminal records into our country? Congressman, we uh, are obligated by law to make sure that when the Department of Homeland Security has a child who is unaccompanied, who's crossed the border, that they are transferred to our care. And if there is a child who may present security issues, we take measures uh, to provide for that. But we are un obligated under law to take a minor who is unaccompanied from the Department of Homeland Security. I get that, but do you do a background check, a criminal background check? We work with the Department of Homeland Security to both vet the that particular individual, the minor, and when it comes to the process of trying to place the minor, we also go through a vetting process for the potential sponsor. Okay, in July 2022, Kayla Hamilton, an American was sexually assaulted and murdered in Maryland by a 16-year-old alien MS3 gang member from El Salvador who was allowed to enter the U.S. through the unaccompanied alien program. This 16-year-old illegal alien was apprehended by Border Patrol in Texas on March 23, 2022, and then referred to the Office of Refugee Resettlement. According to the alien, members of his family paid $4,000 to a guide who smuggled him to the southwest border. On May 3, 2022, ORR placed the alien with a sponsor, his alleged first cousin in Maryland. As revealed in his case file, the alien had been arrested by police in El Salvador on January 2020 on January 21, 2020, for illicit association with the MS-13 gang. The illegal alien's case file also includes information from law enforcement officials dated August of 22, noting that the alien had tattoos affiliating with gang, affiliated with gang activity. There was no indication in the case file that either DHS or HHS provided that noted gang-affiliated tattoos on his body at the time of his apprehension or placement in the, into the United States. So... Secretary Becerra, um, that's really concerning to me. Here you have illegal alien minors with gang tattoos being brought into our country. Um, <clears throat> the Judiciary Committee sent you a letter a year ago, February 27, 2023. I'm sure you've read it. And in this letter, it asked for a detailed description of and related documents regarding how HHS established and verified, if at all, the familiar relationship between the woman he identified as his aunt and the case materials referring or relating to the vetting of the sponsor, the woman he identified as his aunt. You have not responded to this letter with those questions. Can I get your commitment right now to respond to this letter, to the, judici the Judiciary Committee concerning this perpetrator, this monster that killed this young lady that brutally raped and murdered her? Congressman, let me, I, I was not aware of that particular letter not having been responded to. Let me get back to you. I commit to you to work with you to make sure that we can try to respond to your request. Well, thank you. As, um, as someone from whose community another illegal alien murdered a very young lady, a nursing student, uh, Lake and Riley, this is greatly concerning to me. And um, <clears throat> I think it's paramount that HHS vet not only the sponsor, but vet the child or, or vet the UAC coming into our country, especially when the person has on their body visual evidence that this is a gang member and a violent person. We cannot allow American citizens to become victims of illegal aliens. And, and Congressman, once again, we can go through the process with you if you'd like a, a, a briefing on the vetting that we do of the children along with the vetting that the Department of Homeland Security does. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Siskamani. On that note, real quick, I am also interested in the uh, on the briefing there on the vetting, both for the minor and, and for the um, for the sponsor as well, if, if you can add me to that. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Secretary Sarah, I appreciate you highlighting in your testimony the, <clears throat> the need to advance technology and continue to digi digitally integrate providers into the rest of the healthcare system. 
Uh, but but I got I got a question. Your department of seriousness when when the administration, your administration, took weeks to inform the public about a cyber attack on February twenty first um, that saw millions of dollars in lost and delayed revenue for providers in my district. Th this was a big big deal for specifically one one provider in my district. This delay is obviously unacceptable. Uh, can you just briefly walk me through the timeline of this event and share why the delay occurred? And also, why after my staff reached out about this um, weeks ago and, and have passed and, and we still haven't had a response from your office on, on this incident, uh, the cyber attack? Okay, Congressman, I, I absolutely will follow through with you, but I, I want to make sure I understand because the, the day that the uh, cyber attack occurred on February 21st, we already, be, we already had stood up our ASPR operations, our preparedness and response operations to start working on this. And within 24 hours, we were in the mode of trying to respond. And within, within less than a week, we were already in deep communication with providers. We started communicating with United Health, the owner of Change Healthcare, within 24 hours, I believe, of the cyber attack. So I'm not sure where you got the information, but from the get-go, we've been working it. That's why we responded so quickly. And to date, we have uh, already put out close to, I believe, uh, two and a half, three billion dollars in advance payments through the Medicare program to providers who aren't getting paid otherwise. And we made flexibilities available to those providers so they could get their payment now instead of waiting for the processing to occur. Well, I, I do want to see that information because that's one of the one of the questions that we asked that we haven't gotten a response to. So to add some clarity here, some transparency on what happened, because a provider in my district, uh, literally, they were the only ones, but 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 they saw a big hit on 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 their on their delayed revenue here. So this this was an impact for my district. That's what I'm hearing from my own constituents on this, and that's why I brought it up. I haven't gotten a response besides what you just mentioned, so I'm looking forward to getting a, a more detailed response and walkthrough of what, what happened and, and how to prevent this from happening again, because I, I, I want to know, you know, when, when we look at funding this uh, on the billions of dollars and, and we don't have a full measure of accountability and transparency, we, we can't allow that. So I, I want to know what guarantees you can provide that, that will open the, the, the process and be transparent with, with us, with the members of Congress, for, for the future in, in these kind of incidents. So I'll, I'll wait to hear a response from you, hopefully in writing soon here, uh, since we, we wrote to your department weeks ago. We'll follow up. I, I would say this. I, I can tell you one thing that we will need. It will be the flexibilities under existing law within Medicare and Medicaid, because we cannot, for example, we can only forward through advanced payments so much money by law, and so we're restricted. So if the if the change healthcare organization doesn't get its systems back up in place quickly, we'll be constrained by statute on how much flexibility we can. Well, provide. I do want to talk to more more about that with you. Okay. So I look forward to getting that response. Okay. I want to fit in one more question on on Head Start. Um, uh, you know, on, on the notice of proposed rulemaking published by the Office of Head Start titled the Supporting the Head Start Workforce and Consist and uh, Consistent Quality Programming which several leaders in the Head Start community have expressed concern about that uh, to me. Uh, while increasing the pay of overall lifestyle of educators is a worthwhile goal that I also share, the rulemaking states that implementing the various provisions of the rule would cost around $1.6 billion, that's the estimated, each year until 2020, 2033. Now, your budget request only includes about four, $543 million increase for the Office of Head Start. Does this mean that the Biden administration is either moving away from the proposed rulemaking, or is this an unfunded mandate? Uh, neither. Uh, we are providing funding for the slots that can be used. Uh, you're probably aware that we right now uh, authorize close to uh, three quarters of a million uh, Head Start slots in America, but I think close to 100,000 of them are not filled. We have about 560,000 uh, slots that are used by children in Head Start. But states are authorized to provide up to 600 and I, I don't know the precise number, 650,000 or so. What's happening is it's it's very difficult for some of these centers to fill those slots because of cost, of finding professionals to offer the care. And so what we're simply saying is let's recognize what we can fund, but let's do it the right way. Let's not try to have people working for less money than they can earn flipping burgers at the at the fast food joint. And so what we're doing is being realistic. Let's have quality healthcare, uh, head, head, 
Head Start slots for these kids. And let's make sure that we're providing quality workforce for these families. Well, I, I'm in agreement on, on the on the pay here. And, and I've recently introduced two different bills that de- that support and deal with Head Start and making sure that we have what we need there specifically on the on the head on the uh, workforce area. I just want to caution uh, your department on, on the one size fits all here solution that you know for all and having unrealistic and, and detrimental for small rural Head Start programs that are more likely to have less financial flexibility and community resources to draw from. That, that's a concern of mine. That's, that's a, the largest part of my district in terms of geography. Um, Head Start is important in every aspect of my district, both the urban and the rural areas. So this is a, a, an important issue for me. And, and I want to make sure that we don't have these unfunded mandates or that we are holding true to, to making sure that Head Start is, is in, in a good And position. by the way, some of the best Head Start centers are in rural communities. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Hoyer, I appreciate your comment, uh, and I'm, I mean that res- respectfully. I would, uh, and I don't want to get into the debate about uh, marijuana and cigarettes right now, although I believe we need to be having some more conversation up here on this hill about the uh, harmful effects of marijuana and the state's rights to circumvent federal law. Uh, but this is probably not the time for that. And so since I saw the word appropriations over the door out here, I'm going to try to turn back, Mr. Secretary, the conversation to appropriations. Uh, as this committee puts together a funding bill for the upcoming fiscal year, we're going to have to set priorities about how to spend the taxpayers' dollars. And importantly, we have to stick to the limit uh, set for our subcommittee. With that in mind, I want to ask you about some of the ways HHS's budget proposes paying for its priorities because they some of those appear to exceed the principles agreed to in the uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act. The uh, HHS budget also has mandatory funding proposals for things traditionally paid for with discretionary appropriations. A few examples include $1.4 billion for cancer moonshot activities at the National Institute of Health, $150 million for a community violence intervention initiative at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and another CDC proposal for $1 billion for vaccines for adults. Why, Mr. Secretary, did the administration propose these expansions to mandan- the mandatory side of the budget, especially given the warnings that we hear from the CBO about the projected growth in mandatory spending and what it means to our growing debt. Congressman, uh, thank you for the question. And uh, clearly, you've hit the ground running in your in your new committee assignment. So congratulations to you. Uh, let me just use one of the examples, uh, vaccines for adults. We have a program uh, for children, vaccines for children program, which is very successful. And the reason so many children have been vaccinated and kept safe from things like measles and other other types of very contagious diseases. That program, Vaccine for Children, is on the mandatory side. And it's because it is widespread, the the utility and value is well known, and rather than have to go through the constant discretionary budgeting process of allocating money for something we know is indispensable, we consider it a, a mandatory program. Vaccines for adults are no different. And we know from COVID that if you didn't get vaccinated, chances are you were the one in the hospital or perhaps dying. We want to move that to the mandatory side because, again, it's indispensable, it's universal, and it's something that will not only benefit the individual but uh, American society. And so the purpose of moving some of these programs into the man- on the mandatory side is because it's, there's a clear value in not having to go through the yearly exercise of saying you'll allocate dollars for a very uh, worthwhile purpose. And so to follow up, exactly what would that value be? Do you not think that the taxpayers deserve to, uh, to have this dialogue and, and to have the expenditures questioned year, year after year? Why should we just take for granted that carte blanche in, for perpetuity that, uh, that we'll spend these mandatory dollars? Yeah, uh, Congressman, having served where you are for 24 years, uh, you have that opportunity to have that discussion. In fact, you have the right... Uh, not just the opportunity, to actually change that so that it won't be a mandatory program or it will become a mandatory program. That's that's the purpose of these hearings and your debates. You all decide if it's a mandatory or discretionary uh, program. We live by your uh, uh, 
uh, direction, and we'll try to make sure that we provide the, the type of services that you expect. But honestly, you all just, the reason the adult vaccination program is not mandatory is because Congress has not yet decided to do so. President Biden has said, we believe it is now time to make it a mandatory program. It is worthwhile to do. Right. Thank you. I'd just like to uh, make a comment to the chair and to the rest of the committee that I would resist adding any more mandatory spending to our budget. I think every dollar should be challenged with every, every budget. So, thank you. With that, I yield back. Uh, with uh, a final statement, uh, I want to re recognize uh, the ranking member, DeLauro. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate the opportunity. Just one or two observations. I think we've got um, a, a, a task cut out for us on, on, this, on this committee, one that was raised by uh, Chair Adderholt, and that is uh, with the, um, uh, the um, uh, follow-up services, if you will, uh, to uh, unaccompanied children and um, uh, what your, uh, what HHS's responsibility, you have that responsibility uh, as unaccompanied that they come from, uh, uh, that we have to by law uh, accept unaccompanied uh, children. Uh, but then when the uh, 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 sponsors are vetted, et cetera, and the, and, the, and the child goes, then after that, HHS does not have authority to, in, into, uh, uh, to, ch to check into what's happening. And in that, I think that we ought to examine the kinds of authority that uh, HHS should have. Um, and quite frankly, that should not be an unfunded mandate. That should be one in which uh, we deal with the resources that are necessary to be able to accomplish that. And uh, I think uh, that would answer some of the questions of safeguarding uh, children uh, uh, in this country. And, and I might add with regard to that, because the, the uh, issue that uh, c came out uh, uh, in the conversation about that was what is happening uh, with youngsters, and they wind up uh, uh, in, in, in child labor uh, situations. Just, and you made a reference, uh, Mr. Secretary, to the Department of Labor, and um, I've been working with the, the Department of Labor on this issue, and we've been trying to get increases to the wage and hour division so that, in fact, we could investigate what is happening in some of these uh, 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 enterprises uh, which are dealing with child labor in some of our very big corporations in this nation. Um, and I might also add that the administration did ask for increased dollars last year for this very, very purpose. But I also will add that we could not come to an agreement to increase the funding to look into this effort. So we can outline the problem, but we need to then be willing to look at the solution and to provide the resources for the solution as, uh, as, as, as well. Um, uh, so th those two issues, and, and I suppose, um, uh, and I welcome you, Mr. Edwards, to the committee. I should have done that early on. It's a great, great committee. Um, uh, and, and I think people will tell you that I speak my mind um, on, on this committee. Is that true, Mr. Molinar? <laughs> um, but I would just say, I, uh, I heard Mr. Clyde's comment, and I'll see him on the floor and mention this to him, troubled uh, by uh, some of the uh, 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 issues that he did. And uh, life is precious. No one's life should be taken under any set of circumstances. But I would also say uh, some of us get very, very troubled, and I hope it's widespread, that are troubled uh, uh, by the mass murders uh, that are committed, uh, something like Sandy Hook and Uvalde, and those committed with an AR-15 weapon, and that we don't seem to want to deal with any kind of a uh, solution to that problem. Uh, we can't be troubled by only one source of, of victimizing or killing of people, but we must look at it more broadly. And we have the power in this institution to do something about that. I want to say a thank you to you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. But thank you so much 
for the years of, of, of public service. It was Shirley Chisholm who said, uh, public service is the rent we pay uh, for space on this earth, and you have paid that rent over and over and over again. I'm pleased with the priorities in the president's budget, child care and Head Start, women's health, reproductive health, public health, behavioral health, biomedical research, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services, CMS. We need to continue to build on the investments of the last two years in our critical health and human services program. I look forward to working with you to finalizing 2024, and I'm hoping it's in the matter of the next couple of days on Labor Age, uh, 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 which will provide important investments and stability at HHS for the rest of this year and how we can work together in 2025. Thank you so much for being here and for your work. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the time. Thank you, and uh, Secretary Becerra, thank you for your time today. And, and um, I know you've got a busy day today. We appreciate uh, your answers and uh, being available for this committee hearing. So thank you very much. And with that, uh, seeing no further business, we are adjourned. <laughs>